you have flexibility because you know you have school pick up and drop off and you need to work within those parameters and like yeah. you don't need to be sitting in meetings unnecessarily because we could do the work asynchronous through you know technology and other systems so I think it becomes good for the community when women has have economic power and money in their hands because they just tend to be good for the world and we want to see more of that and nothing wrong with you know guys that own businesses I think there's a lot of them that do also very good Um, they have a lot of help. So we don't necessarily want to focus our attention there. And we want to empower women to feel that they can succeed, that they can have the business that is providing for them and their families, and then beyond them have a bigger impact into the community. Welcome to the Designers Oasis podcast. I'm your host, Kate Bendewald. If you're tired of one-size-fits-all advice to running your interior design business, you're in the right place. Join me each week as we dive into topics to help you run a thriving interior design business without the hustle. We'll talk about the business of design, but also mindset and mental health, because I know when you thrive, so will your life and business. It wasn't that long ago that I stepped away from my corporate interior design job to build my own design business so that I could realize my own creative dreams, have more time with the people I love, and serve my clients at the highest level while making more money than I ever could have working for someone else. It wasn't always easy, and I made my share of mistakes along the way. Fast forward to today, and I've learned a thing or two. Since then, I've built multiple six-figure interior design businesses on authentic word-of-mouth referrals with many repeat clients. And I want to share it all with you, the ambitious, inspired, and I get it, occasionally overwhelmed interior designer who shares this dream of transforming lives through the art of interior design. You can do this. Thank you for letting me spend part of this day with you. Let's get to it. My guest today is Carla Titus, the founder and CEO of Wealth and Worth Within. She is a seasoned financial expert, and today she is on a mission to empower business owners to take control of their finances, to grow profits, have cash in the bank, and pay themselves so that they can build personal wealth. She loves working with interior designers to help them achieve financial clarity and peace of mind so that you can get back to the work you enjoy doing. Carla offers fractional CFO services and financial consulting to interior designers looking to grow their business profitably. Today, we're talking about scaling your business sustainably so that you are still profitable. I am so excited to get into this. Please welcome my guest, Carla Titus. Hi, Carla. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. And I can't wait to share all the knowledge and answer all the questions about financial management in your business so you can make it fun. I love it. I will be I will be honest with you. I talk about finance. I live, eat, breathe it in my own business, but it's not something that I love. <laughs> right. It's just a it's a I don't want to even call it a, a necessary evil because it's not evil. It's good. We love money. We got to manage it, organize it and all that stuff. But I love it when I can talk to somebody like yourself who can sort of peel away the layers and the mystery of like, how do we all make this work uh, so that we can continue to be the creatives that we are and run a, run a business mm-hmm. for, for a long time. Right. And so I, I feel I feel good when I can have somebody here to kind of break it all down for, for us. So why don't we, why don't we jump right in? Sounds good. I want to start by asking you what's behind the name. I really love uh, the name of your business, Wealth and Worth Within, but I have a feeling that there might be a bit of a story there. Uh, What is, what is behind the name? Yeah, there is definitely a story and it started when I um, started to work with clients. Um, first I volunteer with a company to just help them, you know, with their finances, they were struggling and they needed to make some decisions. So ultimately we ended up selling that company, which was great for that founder to be able to move on. But then one of my other clients, I noticed like this trend of working with, um, women owned businesses at the time that they really had a good intuition. They just weren't doing, making decisions from a perspective of looking at the data or the numbers. And so mm-hmm. I felt that it was within them 
which is part of the name, to be able to do this, but they needed some guidance. They needed a, you know, a, a guide to really demystify and clarify, boil it down to the simple terms of what they needed to know to be able to manage things. And they've gotten this far on their own and they just need a little help. And so um, you know, creating wealth was one aspect of what we were doing for our clients. We wanted them to pay themselves and be able to build their personal wealth through their business, that it was ideally better than a job and that they were fast tracking their way to wealth um, worth because we wanted to, to create more value for their business. Like the valuation of the business be higher because they're having better off, better financial outcome. And it was within them and they just needed a little help to get there, right? Someone who can just explain things in simple terms, not come with all the lingo and all the things and complicate right. it, make it complex, but really simplify it for them to be able to achieve it on their own. And there's a whole, you know, brand inspiration video I have on my Instagram where I share a little bit more about that story and how that name came about and the process I went through to, you know, decide on that. Ooh, this is so good. Carla, I have goosies because right now I'm in a season where I'm really spending some time thinking about and focusing on and journaling and reading and listening and meditating on this idea that I, like you, I also see a trend of, you know, I'm going to say women in this case, because that's the folks I work with primarily. There's and, and I struggle with this too, but sort of a lack of trust in yourself and wanting to change that conversation with women and with designers that, like you said it, they had the intuition that was already there. They just needed a guide, someone to kind of help them along, right? It's not this necessarily like hero's journey, but maybe it is. And so what's what resonates so much for me about what I just heard you say was that you recognize that the intuition and the wisdom is already there. We just need to put some put some framework around it. And so that's that's kind of how you you help women. So so thank you for that because it fits beautifully with some of the conversations I'm hoping to have this year and talk more about is really helping designers recognize and, and own their their own. Uh, wisdom uh, that that already exists and and trust themselves. So, cool. Yeah, we want to like continue to grow their confidence and what they're doing by bringing different aspects and really sharing with them what numbers can do to help transform their decision making going forward. And not that they have done anything wrong in the past. It's just sure. that this becomes an even better way to make decisions by bringing in the numbers to really help them you know, understand what's working well, what's not working, what they should do more of, less of, and where they can really work smarter, not harder to still achieve the goals that they want to achieve in their business. Yeah. Why did it become important for you to work specifically with women, women in business? Uh, I, I know you have a couple of niches that you work with, but interior designers is a part of that. What drew you to this work specifically um, in your career? Yeah, I mean, selfishly, I'll say I'm an amateur interior designer, I think. Um, I play around with that. But uh, besides that, I think that there is just so much power in the transformation that designers do for people in like their space, you know, to feel relaxed and enjoy their their homes, you know, where they live. So I think like we need more of that in the world. And then specifically around women-owned businesses, because I think, and by the way, we do have fantastic male clients we work with as well. You know, we love on them. They take care of us. We take care of them. It's great. Um, but I think the niche around women-owned businesses is because we feel that women-owned businesses do so much good in the world. They give back more. They provide flexible jobs for working parents. And they are able to have the impact and you know, really think about the community at large. And I think that it's just important for us to continue to see more women business owners thrive and succeed. And they bring others along with them, give them opportunities that maybe have otherwise and create jobs and, you know, av available jobs that weren't there before that don't follow the norms of, yeah. you know, other big companies. Like you have flexibility because, you know, you have school pick up and drop off and you need to work within those parameters and like yeah. you don't need to be sitting in meetings unnecessarily because we could do the work asynchronous through you know technology and other systems so I think it becomes good for the community when women has have economic power and money in their hands because they just tend to be good 
for the world and we want to see more of that and nothing wrong with you know guys that own businesses i think there's a lot of them that do also very good um they have a lot of help so we don't necessarily want to focus our attention there and we want to empower women to feel that they can succeed, that they can have the business that is providing for them and their families, and then beyond them have a bigger impact into the community. I love it so much. I, most of the people listening are probably listening through the, the podcast, but we also do this uh, through YouTube. But if you're watching on YouTube, I've got my hands in the air because we're going to church and I am yes to everything you said. And it's just true. Like we've, there's there's data and research to back it up that when women have wealth, when women have financial freedom, there's so much good that can come out of that. So the the person themselves is not the only one benefiting, but their communities, their schools, uh, their their organizations around them, the the other families that they impact. And so I I am I'm right there with you. And um so let, let's get into can you you are a fractional CEO for business owners. Um, you, as I mentioned a minute ago, you have a few different uh, uh, fields or category. What am I trying to say? Niches that you work with, uh, but interior designers is one of them that you specialize in. And you have a combined 15 years of corporate financial planning, analysis, strategy, and online business CFO consulting experience. So can you share with us exactly what is a fractional CEO and how do you fit in to the financial team with your clients? Yeah, that's a great question. And we get asked this a lot because I think there's a, a gap in education on what this role might be for a company and when is it time to bring it on and why would you even need one um, like this? So in the role of chief financial officer for a company, as you know, big corporations have they partner with the CEO to make decisions. They bring in the financial expertise and lens to really help drive the direction of the company financially, also set the plan like the goals and like what we're going to achieve and whether or not we're on track or off track monitoring performance along the way. Why this is important for small businesses is because normally you don't have access to this type of expertise or partnership because one, you can't afford it. CFOs are expensive. You know, they're two, three, two, three, four hundred thousand dollars a year plus share, you know, shares and bonuses on top of that, uh, because that is the type of, you know, they, obviously do much more value than what they cost to the company in delivering a financial plan that the company can achieve. And so what we do is we took what we, you know, my knowledge in corporate and my financial experience in consulting and brought it to a small business at an affordable price by making it a fractional role, meaning a part-time role or less than part-time sometimes, where we can support clients to still do all that planning, the financial vision, strategy, direction, setting, look and review at the numbers together, answer money questions that maybe your bookkeeping team right now is not, you know, skilled or prepared or experienced to be able to support you with, or neither is your accountant that's only focused on you once a year when tax time comes. And you're asking right. these people, hey, I want to have answers to my money questions. And they're like, uh, yeah, no, I just want to sit behind the computer and do your transactions and then give you a report. Don't talk to me. Um in the most loving way possible. That's just the kind of role that they want to have, right? The function they want to play. And the accountant might be like, hey, I have 400 other clients, so I don't have time for one-on-one -on -one questions and be able to deep dive into, should I hire? When can I afford to do this? Can I invest this much in materials? Like, should I pre-order some of the furniture I'm trying to you know, sell to my clients in the design plan? They're not going to sit down with you and look at those details. That's the function mm -hmm. of a CFO and why your business might need one at some point as you're growing and scaling. And you're really kind of feeling like, I'm not sure what I should be doing. I know I have ideas. Can I afford it? Can someone please answer those questions for me? And we do it through financial analysis by looking yeah. at, okay, here's the cost, here's the benefit. And then here's what you can afford to do. This makes so much sense. And I do want to clarify, um, I think I said CEO, fractional CEO earlier. And what I meant to say was fractional CFO, because that is a different uh, role uh, because of, you are focused on the financial piece specifically. So I just wanted to correct myself there. Um, so cool. So what, what we're talking about here is your bookkeeper is looking at your business through the lens of like your chart of accounts, balancing the books, court, uh, 
corresponding everything that you're doing inside your business with the uh, QuickBooks accounting and your all that stuff, right? We got that. We know what a um, accountant does for you, a, a CPA at the end of the year, um, helping you with your taxes and all of that fun stuff. But where Carla comes in is really helping designers understand their business's big picture, financial picture, helping them strategize in terms of what can they do? What are some areas, some levers that we can pull on to increase our profits? And so to me, I hear like you're a, you're a really a partner with them mm-hmm. and helping them look at their financial, the financial piece of the business in a more strategic way. I I wish that when I was in the height of my career running a business that I'd had a CFO, uh, a fractional CFO on my team helping me do that. Because there were so many times that I made decisions. And I do I, I do look at my numbers uh, very closely and I sort of think about these things. But I also make a lot of financial decisions on intuition, which I know is not always financial experts favorite way of doing things. But I did it and I got by on it just fine. And I did really well. Mm-hmm. Um, but there were so many times where I just didn't know how to piece it all together. And I just had to make a decision hiring, for example, on a gut with a gut check and a looking at the book, looking at the balances and just doing it. And it really wasn't grounded in any sort of like real hard math. There was loose math. There was big picture math, like I'm not saying I didn't wasn't looking at that at all, but a lot, but it, it and I just mm-hmm. did it kind of scared, right? I just did it without knowing, and it and it worked out, right? Most of the time, I never had any major financial um, challenges in my business. But uh, what a relief it would be to have somebody like you to help go through those decision making moments, right? Yeah. And what you said about partnering is real, right? One, you know, being a business owner is lonely. You don't have another person you can talk to about these things. Like your employees don't want to know that you can't make payroll in two weeks, right? Like that's the whole thing. That's who you go to your CFO for. And then we solve the problem and try to work on a plan to get you on a healthy cash flow. I think the lack of preparation around the, some of those big decisions like hiring and like if you don't have enough cash and then you're expecting someone to come up and perform right away, like the timing of it could be off and you're literally winging it, right? That's a very common thing. And sometimes it works great. Like, listen, not everybody is going to need us here for always, but like right. you could definitely get definitely perspective, uh, more insights, and then know the number. So you know the risk going into that decision you're still making. And there's times I've done analysis for clients that say you shouldn't do that thing. And they still decided to go forward with it. And I said, okay, how do we mitigate the risk? And then make sure that we have enough cash to weather if this doesn't work out. And then it all works out and it's great. So yeah really our function is to bring that perspective, bring that second brain to the business to say, hey, have you thought about this 10 other options that you could go down with when it comes to hiring that maybe you didn't even consider like bringing someone contractor, bringing someone part-time, only doing five hours a week if that's all you need right now and growing with them, you know, over time with a role. And I think sometimes we just get stuck with like doing what everyone else is doing and not thinking outside the box. So we get really creative about problem solving with a business owner or like the CEO of the business and then come up with their better outcomes because of it. Right. And then mm-hmm. take risk at the adequate level so that we can see it through and then be around for a long time to continue to design beautiful homes and places for, our, you know, the people that we want to impact through the work that you do and then get to do more of that because you have the money to do the impact that you want to have. Yeah. 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 I love it. I think there's just so much peace of mind that can come from having this, um, this partner relationship available to you. I want, so, okay. So today we're really going to focus on the idea of scaling your interior design business. So we're really talking to designers who have been in this for a bit, right? You've got some experience or more established and it's like you kind of reach a plateau where you've got good clients, like things are clicking, things are working. You've got good clients. You've got, you've got the, the, in the flow of client work is coming in, right? Um, but it, it, <laughs> I'm feeling, I'm like, oh, I remember this feeling where it's like, oh, and I've got these projects coming in, but I don't have the capacity to do all of them now. And I'm having to like 
push them off six months to get started, right? It's a mm-hmm. great problem to have, but sometimes you just want to get the project rolling, right? For the client, yeah. because otherwise you're going to miss out because it doesn't work for their timeline, right? And so you can sort of plateau and hit this, this ceiling where you need to hire, you might need to find office space. Um, you might need to invest in different kinds of software to help you do things faster, whatever the case may be. So there's all of these different ways that you need to spend money to make money, right? And so I I know that uh, this can be really agonizing for designers who are at this mm-hmm. place because we can't always see how it would all work together. How can I know mm-hmm. that, you know, by hiring this person, I'm going to get my return on investment? So I want you to walk us through when we, when we, when you're working with a designer and they can't see how do I get from point A to point B and still be able to pay myself and still be able to run the business and not dip into savings. How do you approach that with them to help them understand how to go about it? Do you have a framework? What What's your process? Yes, we actually do have a framework for this because we know how complex this can get and there's so many moving pieces, right? So like, to be fair, this is not a simple exercise that you just throw some numbers on a spreadsheet and then you off you go, right? right? The reason why we help clients with this is because there's a lot of those pieces that need to fit together, work together towards the same end goal. And so when we're thinking about hiring and the cost of hiring the, you know, the amount of time it takes and then onboarding projects and making sure you have the right people supporting the right projects at the right time, that you're paying them the right amount that you've gone in those deposits ahead of time to be able to cover some of the cost of bringing on new people and hiring, like all the timing of that is going to be critical. So what we do is we outline it in a financial plan and we start looking at before you make a decision to hire, before you make a decision to take on those projects that you pushed out six months, we say, what would it look like if we pull in those six months projects out now and hire a person to help us support that? And then we start to go through all the variables, right? We go look at what is the price that we put on that project? How are we going to get paid for that project? When are we expecting the money to come in? When are we bringing that person on to do the training and get them onboarded into our company with all the tools and resources and things they need to be successful? And really creating that really detailed 30, 60, 90 day plan for that onboarding for the new hire. Because here's the thing, you could put numbers together all day long, but if you can't execute to those numbers and continue to monitor performance towards that, you'll most likely not achieve them and be off track before you even get started. So the goal um, of putting the plan together is not just putting the plan together, but it's also following the plan. And that's where we come in to help you you know, stay on track and make sure, okay, did we hire the person? That means we need to put an ad out. We need to start, you know, vetting candidates, uh, going through interview process. How long do we think that's going to take us? Then how long is the training going to take? When would they start to see the first client? So we need to then prepare our cash flow to whether those maybe first 60 days where they're not producing any results for they're just getting onboarded and then go on to starting to work with a client and get that deposit so we can get started. Right. And so it's all around the timing. It's all around the, the inputs to the plan. Then you got to think about, okay, when am I ordering, uh, placing you know, furniture orders, tile orders, whatever the materials you need to make this job happen, you'll need to have the cash for that too. Um, on top of having the cash for the new hire. And then it all depends on like when the money is coming in for those project milestone invoices that you're doing. And if you haven't thought of that, this is the time when we do all of it so that we can look at it comprehensively, understand what are our margins, what are our profit expected after covering the cost of bringing this person on. And then we say, okay, this plan seems viable. It's solid. What are our risk areas? What if something goes wrong? What could go wrong? Think through that problem, know that we have a solution to it, and then go move forward with the plan that now we have clarity on solid numbers to follow and we know we are performing to that or we're not and then we need to pivot and make something else happen or make different decisions because of it but having the plan to start as a designer you'll get the peace of mind because you'll know okay i know what needs to happen i know my timeline i know my cost now i can move forward with certainty because i've done the work ahead of time on that decision being viable and what I expect to get out of the decision that benefit that ROI from that employee that I'm bringing on and when I expect to see that materialize. So that way you can hold people accountable. You can say, hey, your onboarding period was 60 days. We're in 90 days and I haven't seen you taking a client call yet. This is a problem. We need to address it before it becomes a problem. Yeah, 
Yeah. What's what I love about this so much is that it's it's not just putting together the numbers. And I can't tell you how many times I've had designers come to me and they ask me like, how much money should I have saved up to hire or to leave my name? I'm like, I you throw out a number at you. I don't know your business or your finances. And not to mention, I don't know that I'm fully equipped to do that for somebody. But so it's it's not just throwing spaghetti at the wall, right? We're putting we're we're thinking about the nuances of your business, not a mm-hmm. business, your specific business, um, your capacity, what you're capable of, what are all of those ins and outs, right? And and then weighing that against the risk so that you can feel really informed about how you how you move forward. Hey designer, are you tired of wasting precious time with prospective clients who are not a right fit? Do you experience imposter syndrome because you know the back end of your business is kind of a hot mess? Perhaps you're experiencing growing pains and you don't have the tools, resources, or team to support you. I get it. I've been there. As an ambitious interior design business owner myself, I know the roller coaster ride this can be. Over the years, I've learned a thing or two about running a profitable word of mouth design business, and I want to help you find success too. How would it feel to wake up and face the day knowing exactly what to focus on next? having a roster of enthusiastic clients, including a paid wait list, and having the space, time, and creative energy to develop projects that you are proud of and are portfolio, if not pressworthy. I want to invite you to learn more about the Interior Designers Business Blueprint, a business coaching program designed exclusively for interior designers who want to serve their clients at the highest level while making good money, but without the burnout and overwhelm. If you're ready to get off the roller coaster, you don't have to do it alone. Join me inside the Interior Designers Business Blueprint and get the tools, teaching, and community you need to pave the way for an interior design business your clients love and you are proud of. To learn more, grab the link on your audio player or head to designersoasis.com forward slash blueprint. That's designersoasis.com forward slash blueprint. You touched on something that I want to, I want to come back to though. Outsourcing is a common strategy to scaling. I don't know how you define it, but when I think of outsourcing, I'm thinking of loosely like hiring independent contractors versus employees, whether they work hand in hand with you in your studio, in your office, or whether they're remote, that's neither here nor there, I think for the sake of this conversation. Mm -hmm. Correct me if you think differently, but how it's a, it's a, it's a very powerful strategy if done right. How do you help clients understand their return on investment when deciding whether or not to outsource um, and who to outsource to? So sometimes clients come to us with not the clarity on what they really need, but they know they need help. (laughs) And so we start by asking like, what's the minimum amount of help do you need? And then if their answer is like, oh, I need someone 40 hours to do this 10 tasks, right? Then we're not going to say all sorts of to a 1099 because that's an employee. Like if they're working 40 hours for you, that's just categorized as an employee. You should pay them in payroll. Let's not mess with, you know, those guidelines. If you, if they say the answer back to me is like, oh, I just need someone for five hours a week to come do some design planning or like work through, you know, like a proposal for a client, then the question is, why would you bring an employee? Like you can outsource that to a contractor um, still, you know, give them a deadline. You don't have to tell them how to do the work. You just need to tell them when you need it back by. And obviously based on their experience, you would decide who you hire. And then that cost is very different than bringing on an employee, right? Because you're getting some partial help, part-time help, which is maybe all the business needs for now. And then as the business grow, you as if those contractors are no longer viable and you need to actually bring a part-time employee longer term. But this is all about being intentional about what is it that we need um, what do we need the gap 
to be close with? And then what are some options we can assess? So outsourcing is always an option. And I think people just overlook it because they're always like, well, they told me I have to hire employees or I can, people can only work 20 or 40 hours a week for me. Otherwise they don't want to work for me. And that is not true. There's a lot of people out there that want flexibility in their life. They don't want a boss. They want to bill you and invoice you for their time when they want to work, how they want to work. And as long as they're delivering the result, they don't care that you employ them. They care that they have work from you and probably 10 other designers that they work with. So I think we need to reshape, you know, what we think of what are the needs of the business and then align it with what we would hire and what roles we would bring on instead of automatically going to what everyone else is doing, which gets people in trouble because then they overextend themselves. They don't really need the help at that level. And the business is not mature enough or grown enough to be able to support that cost. So that's another aspect of it, right? Is what can you actually afford? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess that speaks to the, to the idea of like, a figuring out if this is the right time, if you're in the if you're in the right time and place in business to to take that step. It's also recognizing that, you know, with an independent contractor, they can really help move things along without that long term responsibility that you have to an employee. So it can be a good sort of half stop if that's what it needs to be. Although I'll say in my business, all except for one of the designers who worked for me were independent contractors. At one point I did promote one to a full-time employee and that's what I needed in that time, right? That was what worked. But um, the best part about it was, is they were not only helping me to, I'm talking about, I'm thinking about return on investment, right? I was paying them a, a, a good amount, what they will ask to be paid, right? But they were helping me get through work, get through projects, move projects along, help clients get results faster because it wasn't just me doing all of it. They were, you know, I was mm-hmm. sort of guiding them, but ultimately they were executing the work um, themselves. And I was able to build them out, you know, or put their cost, build, build it into my services. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, and then for the hourly ones that were, you know, working on projects hourly for me, you know, I'm billing them out two or three or four times what I'm paying them, right. To cover my cost and, and all of this, all of those things. And they're actually providing an additional revenue source for my business while allowing me to deliver a project faster to a client and for cheaper than if I were doing all the work myself. Right. And so you only have so much capacity before you run out of time to do all the things. So if you want to yeah. do more business, you're going to have to bring some help. And yeah. the other thing we didn't touch on, but I think is also really important is that when you hire experienced contractors, they actually could maybe improve your business in other ways, like giving you new ideas, things you didn't think about coming at a design plan from a different angle that you're like, oh, wow, that was way better than I was going to come up with and yeah. surprise you in that way. And so it yeah. also goes back to, you know, you know, the level of expertise and experience and you're feeling comfortable delegating, but that could also be a really positive, you know, ROI on bringing someone that you're outsourcing to um, because they can really come into your business right away and start to take on work, not have to train for 60, 90 days on the way that you do it. Like they have their way, they have their experience and they can just get work done, which Mm -hmm. I think accelerates the path to scaling much quicker. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that will be forever. You know, eventually you'll want to hire an employee and maybe, you know, replace them at some point, or maybe that contractor becomes that employee that has happened to, um, depending on their goals. And so those are things you want to evaluate. And then it all comes back to, you know, what can you afford to do? What's in your budget and your plan? And then um, deciding if those are the right people to support you and your business onto the next stage and the next phase of growth. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's such an important point. And I I was reminded listening to you of that, that was a mistake that I made at one point where I was hiring for an employee role and I interviewed probably eight folks and it ultimately came down to two and I ended up hiring the lesser experienced designer between the two because she wasn't going to require as as much salary as the other designer, mm-hmm. but not by a lot, right? Just looking back on it. And then, you know, it, 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 she was she was a lovely human to work with and she did a great job for me. But there was once I got her into that role, there was so much handholding and 
work that I needed to do to get her up to speed with my quality expectations, those sort of things Mm -hmm. that I think had I taken the chance on the designer who was more experienced and commanded a higher salary, I probably could have gotten further faster. Um, So say la vie, but it was a lesson that I learned kind of the hard way because I was like, kept thinking to myself in those first 90 days, like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm having to like go through all of this. And it was a little bit of regret, but ultimately we got her up to speed and she was great. And she was lovely while she worked with this, but it it was a, I didn't have Carla there to help me understand (laughs) how to, how to think about the way the, the different scenarios. So it really crystallized for me what, how important somebody like you can be to, to a designer. Oh, I, I want to, this leads me to my next question. I understand some of the fear and hesitations that some designers have when wanting to scale their business. When you're scaling a business, meaning you're maybe hiring, maybe you're getting office space, maybe you're buying new office equipment, furniture, that kind of thing. When you're scaling a business, you tend to have more that you're accountable for and to, right? And that can be daunting for a business owner to carry that mental weight of um, that accountability. You can start to become obsessive about money and the finance piece of running your business and and get sucked away from the creative work, right? So Mm -hmm. it's like, it's like, okay, I've taken on this bigger responsibility and now I have to be accountable for it, right? I, I want to make sure that the bills are getting paid and that the money's coming in and everything's flowing. And yes, we that will never change no matter who's on your team, right? But is it possible when scaling for designers to find a sweet spot where, because I think the fear is I'm not going to be able to be a designer anymore. I'm going to have to be the CEO all the time. That's the hat I'm going to be wearing all the mm-hmm. time. And I, I will be able to do the creative work. So is it possible for a designer to find a nice sweet spot where they can have a pulse on their business finances, be in control of it, know what's going on and still have time to actually do the design work? Yeah. And I think that not everybody got into business to just run their business. Like sometimes they actually do like the work. Like in my case, I still have clients. I love doing spreadsheets and financial analysis and problem solving with them and partnering to give them new perspective based on my experience. And I don't think that I will ever go away from that, but you know, like the business demands could increase to the point where we have to reconsider how much time we're spending on that. But I think if you want to still be a designer, there's definitely a place where maybe you delegate a part of what you do, but you keep the parts that you enjoyed the most. Like if you're like, I just don't want to numbers or whatever, you outsource that to someone who does it. And then you come and review it together and really make decisions based on the finalized analysis instead of like, having to put it together right and same thing with design work you could maybe have someone else create a design design plan and then you give your touches and inputs that make it like that much better or like the final result and so I think sometimes we think it's like an all or nothing and we created businesses because we want to enjoy what we're doing so if you enjoy designing why would you stop like there's a place for that you could still run your business on the other 50% of your time and making sure that you're allocated enough time to work on your business, like strategy, vision, you know, the budget, all the things that come with running a business. Because unfortunately, yes, you don't have a job. You just, you have to do all those things that business owners have to do too. But really keep the things that you enjoy. I'm a big advocate of that because we did not create this to just be a job that we do all the things we paid and then that coming to work every day because that's you know, I mean, there's plenty of that out there. So like, if you want to create your business and design it on purpose to be fulfilling, to allow you to be creative, then you need to keep those aspects of it as a top priority and balance that with your time you have spent working on your business, on the overall direction, you know, who you're going to hire, what are you going to do? The, yes, the math behind it, the profits and all that, because we do need to have that money to be able to feel good about the business and pay ourselves so that we don't become resentful of it. But you know what I tell designers too, it's like, if you had a cash cushion, maybe you wouldn't be so stressed out about money. So if we create a cash runway that, you know, you can cover your expenses for two or three months, no matter what happens, then you get to afford to be more creative because you have the safety net, you have that peace of mind. You're not worried about, oh my God, I can, can't pay payroll again in two weeks. You're like, oh, I got that covered for the next three months, even if we don't make another dollar, which that probably never happened because you're good at what you do, sure. but then you get to enjoy to be creative. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, 
this is so good because I've I've talked about this in like Q and A's and stuff off off of the podcast, but it is this idea. Well, I guess on the podcast, too. and I love that you're really drawing a line under this. There's nothing more soul sucking for your creativity that that zaps your creativity than not knowing where your next dollar is coming from, right? And not having clarity of the financial picture and you know, like the, the, the thing that I'll hear sometimes from designers who are trying to figure this out is there's just like, I'm not a numbers person. I'm not a finance person. I'm not a math person. I, I'm not a spreadsheet person. I'm like, honey, you need to be, if you're going to be in business, at least a little bit and you don't have to do it on your own, but you can't just have your head in the clouds and la la land and, uh, you know, and not like, that's what we're doing here. And so you need to sort of like own this responsibility, but it doesn't have to be overwhelming. It doesn't have to take up every hour of your day either. Um, but that is the biggest creativity zap is the anxiety around money, right? It's hard to be yeah. in that creative space when you're stressed out over money. I mean, nobody can, right? <laughs> like, I mean, if you can't pay your personal bills, like everybody's going to yeah. stress about that type of yeah. thing. It's no different in your business. So once your financial health is in a good place and mm -hmm. you feel good about it, then you get to be more creative and not worry so yeah. much about what's happening because you can afford to have the time to react, change the plans or pitch new clients, get new business. Like you get to have the time to mm -hmm. the luxury of time is always what I call it is you're buying yourself that peace of mind and time to react and not have to make decisions from a place of desperation. And, you know, like, that's where we want our business owners to be like enjoying their business. What yeah. this, what is business? What does your business need to do for you? Is what I always ask, because I think that that needs to be in the forefront of everyone's mind on like, we give so much to our business. What are, what is the business doing for us lately? And really yeah. demand of your business <laughs> things yeah. that you need from it, right? Like pay your salary, uh, be able to afford to do certain things, invest in it and really yeah. make it enjoyable by having that peace of mind to get through whatever comes your way. Because as business owners, we know there's never smooth sailing. There's always something that's going to, you know, come up and money can solve a lot of problems. Let's be honest. Like you can throw money at the problems and sometimes they just go away altogether. Yeah. But if you don't have it, that's when it becomes really stressful. Yeah. 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 It is often a barrier to not being able to do the things that you want. I do want to give a quick shout out to my friend, Jenny Carlson, who uh, financials for creatives. Um, she's been a a guest on the podcast before she's also been inside the membership teaching there and we'll link to that podcast episode but she does some really cool work um and i worked with her i, I hired her years ago because i want to talk about money stories for a second we all have money stories and if this work the money work feels hard or you feel resistant or you get emotional or like sometimes there is like a legitimate feeling mm -hmm. of panic and mine came from i'll just be honest because i've talked about this as not, I've talked about this before, so I share this story quite openly, but I grew up with a single mom and we struggled financially my whole life and moved a ton. And it was always, um, it was, it was financially challenging and there was a lot of anxiety around it. So fast forward as an adult, I didn't have the tools and I wasn't equipped to hold money, focus on money, put energy towards money in a healthy way. I retreated from it because that would had been my experience with money. I had to do some of that deep work first in order to get stuck, get unstuck out of some of those old patterns. And Jenny really helped me do that, helped me uncover my money story. So if you're listening to this and you're hearing what Carla can help you with, but you're still having that sort of internal struggle, that internal battle, it might be that there's some money work story, some, some money story work that needs to happen to kind of understand where that's coming from. Because I think, I feel, I know that if you don't address that first, then all of this other stuff is going to be harder to manage and, and work through like all the stuff that you're talking about. And I'm sure you probably do some of that with your clients as you're mm -hmm. um, bringing them on and, and talking through that. So I just, that's a really important piece. I think to not gloss over is that, you know, so we all have money stories. Yeah. We hold space and we're very gentle with the way we approach that aspect of it. Cause it is yeah. true. We do bring our own personal 
traumas with money or like situation with money or maybe even you know positive things about money that we yeah. bring to our business like guys a lot of business owners that love saving and sometimes they're yeah. like saving too much right and like that happens so like why are they saving too much because they're afraid they're not going to have enough or like and we understand that but we're also very gentle around like would you feel comfortable if we use some of this to invest towards growth right and like we kind of help them get through that and get unstuck but we understand that there's a lot behind the scenes that are telling us or not telling us and we try to you know ask where you know we feel comfortable just uncovering where's a little bit of that coming from and then what can we do to help you move on past that so that you're not using that fear to fuel your decision making yeah. but really think logically through the scenarios we run like you know we're re- mitigating risk like every and i think sometimes it's hard to look at your numbers especially when things are not looking great and i always say like it's not about measuring your worthiness it has nothing to do with that this is a business this is an entity yeah. separate from you and it happens to yeah. not be performing great okay well that happens yeah. the goal is what is the progress we're making if we uh-huh. can't measure our starting point, how will we know if we're getting better? And uh-huh. so sometimes I tell business owners like, yeah, maybe it looks really bad, but are we getting better every month? Are we improving year over year? How will we know if we don't even look? And yeah. sometimes that shifts their mindset into, oh, now I can focus on improving, on progress, on making it better rather than dwelling on like how bad it looks, right? Because they yeah. think that is attached to them and their identity or like oh I'm a failure so this is because I didn't do the right thing for them nobody taught you this thing it's like did someone come here and said here's business finances one-on-one here's what revenue is cost of goods sold gross margin like nobody taught you those things and you're expected to just be an expert and know these things and do it all on your own I don't think so and that's why clients come to us because we understand that you didn't have the education. We would love to empower you through knowledge so that you can feel confident now tackling this and also simplify it in a way that is attainable because I think that's what causes us to want to reject looking at it or call ourselves, I'm not a money person or I don't like to look at my numbers. And those are just excuses to not want to like tackle it because you're feeling fear of like, I don't even know. And I don't want to admit that I don't know. But with us, it's okay because we love to educate. Like I literally had a whole education session with a client yesterday around how to pay taxes. What are estimated taxes? How much do you calculate for that? And like, they were like light up because they're like, nobody ever sat me down to talk to me about these things. And they feel so based and yet we are all going around thinking that we all know these things and we don't. And I'm just sitting here thinking, oh, that's basic stuff. And they're like, oh, thank God someone is here to teach me that, right? And we don't mind because we're like, oh, what, what do you mean? You don't know, like happy to teach you, right? Let me show you all the things. Like it, it lights up my day knowing that some of that knowledge is going to be so useful for business owners to apply. Oh my gosh. You're so in your zone of genius with the work you're doing, Carla. It is a gift to women and business owners and interior designers. I love, I, I, I want to not gloss over something really, really, really important that you said. So I want to come back to it, which is we often find ourselves attaching our personal worth with our work and with our business and with what's in the bank account. And I am guilty of this just as much as anybody else. And it is a, it is a journey and it is something I'm trying to be extremely conscious about that. I am separate. My worth is not defined by my business. And you sounds like have that messaging baked into your process when you're talking to your clients. And I think, um, I don't know how, I don't know if other designers feel the same way, but I feel like that's something that we haven't talked about, right? A whole lot. It's just mm-hmm. like, yeah. you are, you are your business, but you're also not. <laughs> so um, you, you can have a financial picture that doesn't look great, but that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. Maybe you made a mistake, but everything is fixable. Everything is figure outable. And uh, you can always, always, always do better. There's always room for improvement. So Really yeah, I always say that. there's sometimes lessons we have to learn by making the wrong decisions. And mm-hmm. as long as we learned the lesson, then it was worth the money we lost or yeah. didn't, you know, the thing that didn't go well. But if we didn't learn the lesson, that's when we <laughs> when I refocus and go back and really learn the lesson to make sure we don't yeah. do it again. But right. that, that identity piece, I think is just what we're told, you know, social media has a whole thing around like seven figure business owner. And I'm like, if your business is a million dollars and it you lose a million dollars every year to make that, 
I am not interested whatsoever in getting to that figure, right? And I think that's the perspective we're missing is we're talking top line revenue or like revenue numbers, but we're talking about vanity metrics because at the end of the day, so what is your profit after you pay yourself and you pay your taxes? And if you have nothing left, I don't care how big your business is. It doesn't matter because you can have a hundred thousand dollar business that keeps seventy thousand dollars a year, and that's way more financially successful than a million dollar business that loses a million every year. What she said, y'all. Yes to that. <laughs> yes to that. Yeah, it's it's looking at the right numbers and putting it into perspective. So, mm-hmm. um, as we wrap up here, I want to ask you this. What is the number one mistake or mindset shift that you would like to see designers start to do earlier on in their business? Or like, is what is something that you see happening over and over again that you just want to like shout from the rooftops and say, if you could just do this one thing differently or whatever, like, do you, what would that thing be that you would love to just help lift up all designers or business owners? Well, you know, in all honesty, there's like 10 different ones, but we're going to try to narrow it down. Because <laughs> it's sure. just like you see that theme, right? Uh-huh. And you're like, oh my God, if someone would just tell you this is not yeah. the way. And, yeah. you know, I mentioned the profit one, right? So like, that's a big one. Like we've gone into business, like money. Other ways to just go work the job because you at least get a paycheck and you don't have to do this whole thing that's stressful. Like it's not worth it if it's not better than a job. So let's get, get it to that point, right? Progress yeah. around that. Um, the other one is around cash flow. Like nobody talks about cash flow. It's real. The timing sucks. It's always like you owe a bill before you get paid. And then how do you cover that? Right. Nobody's talking about it because it seems complicated, but it really is just around the timing on making sure that you're invoicing appropriately for when, you know, you're going to need to pay things and then planning for it so that you don't get caught by surprise. And then you have the right resources in place to cover all the bills that are coming due. And that requires a plan. So you got to look at your cash and make sure that you have enough cash and that your bank account is padded for the unexpected because business is full of surprises, good and bad. And we want to make sure when we get those good months that we're squirreling a little money away and then where months are not so great, we got the money to cover us for that season. So making sure that you understand that and, you know, maybe there's some seasonality in your business that happens often sure. where things slow down a certain time of year. Guess what? Christmas is never a surprise. It happens every year in December and somehow we're not ever prepared for it, right? <laughs> so it's no different in our design business. We know that certain months a year we're going to slow down. So we want to squirrel away during those good months to be able to save for that. And then, you know, be mindful of where you're spending your money. You work so hard for it. And so often I see business owners just buying the next shiny thing, the one magic pill that will solve all their problems. There is no such thing. There is consistency and discipline. There's executing to your plans and sticking with it long enough that it starts to work. And then you continue to do that because guess what? Boring businesses are the ones that are making money. The ones that are doing things over and over again, they're consistent, they're showing up, they're doing the work and they're putting in the reps. And those are the businesses that we get to support that we're seeing succeed over time, right? It's not sexy. It's not the new thing. It's not the new strategy that everybody's trying to sell you. It's that consistent thing that we know works that you're showing up for every day. And sticking with it, because yeah. my goodness, it's so easy to get distracted. Like I get distracted all the time and then I have to refocus. I'm like, am I really like spending money in the right places that I want to be doing because it's making a difference for me? Or is it just entertaining me because I want to have a little fun and like get distracted and, you know, squirrel and all the things, right? <laughs> Which is so easy. So stay focused. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I'll be very honest, that has, has always been the thing that I struggled with. It's like, I, I could make the money, but I also could spend it because I like things, Mm -hmm. you know, and I had to start to be really conscious about, well, wait a second. I worked really hard for that. Like just, you know, and so just trying to be a lot more conscious about where that money's going. And it's a, it's a journey, right. But, um, that was for sure the thing that I, I personally struggled with the most for, for a little while there. Um, cool. Carla, you are a delight and a pleasure. You are a treasure to this this community. And I know that the designers listening are going to feel a little bit lighter after having listened to you, a little bit more optimistic and hopeful. Um, let's say that a designer would like to reach out to you and learn more about what you do. Where can they find you online? Yeah, they can go to our website, wealthworthwithin.com. 
there is a contact page where you can book a call to talk to us if you're ready to hire a fractional CFO or one more information about what that might look like for your business. Um, if you're not ready, you're welcome to sign for our newsletter. We always have amazing new resources that we're putting out for free. We want to educate everyone on being excited about their money and the best ways to handle it. Um, we also let you know what's going on with our business and like our own growth journey as we're scaling as well. So I find that people sometimes like to know more about, you know, who we are and what we do. And then if you want to get some resources that are free again, um, educational ones, then you can follow us on social media at Wealth Worth Within. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. We're always active posting um, new information that maybe you can take action on in your business to get better at it. And we would love for everyone to just, you know, listen to this episode and then do one thing that you heard today that you think would improve your business finances to get you into a better financial state. Mm hmm. Oh my goodness. Okay. We are going to be hundred percent sure to link to all of these things in the show notes. So if you're listening and you're driving, don't worry, we will, we will save it for you and make it easy to find uh, for our listeners. Um, Carla, thank you so much. I appreciate your time and sharing your expertise. Uh, you again are, are just a real treasure and I'm grateful that we've had the chance to talk today. Thanks Kate for having me today. All right. Bye for now, Carla. Bye. Hey friend, thank you so much for letting me spend a part of this day with you. I'm so passionate about helping designers like you, and I believe in a rising tide that when one of us does well, we all do better. So if you share this attitude of abundance with me, I want you to do just one little thing. Please share this episode with someone you think might love it. And if you're feeling extra generous today, go ahead and take just 30 seconds to open your podcast app and leave us a five-star rating and review. It's free for you to do, and it helps me to be able to keep making more episodes and resources for you. However you choose to help, please know I appreciate you so very much. Thank you, my friend. Have a wonderful rest of your day. I'll see you soon.